Okay, this is the second uh, lecture on metabolism. In the last lecture, we looked at the uh, general uh, aspects of anabolism, catabolism. We reviewed the uh, role of acetyl-CoA and the citric acid or Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation and the production of ATP. So I won't go through that. Um, so this video, we're gonna focus on carbohydrate metabolism, lipid metabolism, and protein metabolism. Okay, so let's review carbohydrate metabolism here first. Um, so remember that after the digestive process, we should only be absorbing monosaccharides across the enterocytes, and that would be either glucose, fructose, or galactose. So that's the end product of breaking down all of your carbohydrates. Uh, in the liver, fructose and galactose are converted to glucose. So glucose is really our central molecule of carbohydrate metabolism. Now the fate of glucose in the liver, so I'm just gonna focus on the liver first, has three different roles. Um, really there's three different fates for glucose and all of these require insulin. So insulin really helps the liver uh, metabolize uh, glucose appropriately. So the first uh, role of glucose in the liver would be to use it for energy. So liver cells need energy and they can actually use glucose for energy and they can uh, make energy in the way that we just talked about in the last video via glycolysis into pyruvate and then via the uh, Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP. Um, but the liver only needs a little bit of that energy from glucose. So we bring in a lot more glucose from the diet than the liver needs for energy. Um, so basically the liver is gonna have to do two other things with all the remaining glucose it can store up some of that glucose as glycogen. Um, and that's via the process called glycogenesis. So making new glycogen. Um, so essentially glycogen is like starch inside of liver cells. And that is a storage form for uh, glucose. And that can be released into the blood as your blood sugar falls. So let's say after the meal, you got a bunch of glucose going to the blood, that's fine for a couple of hours. But as the cells in the body use up that glucose, your blood sugar starts to drop the liver will release glucose back into the blood from that glycogen. So the liver has sort of this normalizing effect on glucose, and that can last for you know a few hours, five, six, seven hours. Um, seven might be a little long, but maybe up to five hours, a little bit more, um, for uh, the liver's ability to store up glycogen and then release that into the blood. Um, and so as your blood sugar falls, it normalizes. Uh, glycogenolysis is the process of breaking down glycogen back into glucose. So the two processes here, if we start with glucose, and we'll see in the body we actually have to make a special form of glucose called glucose 6-phosphate. What's interesting in liver cells is if you have a liver cell here, or any cell really, and here's glucose, remember that some cells need insulin uh, to get the glucose into them. Turns out liver cells don't. But when the glucose comes into the liver cell, um, it has to be phosphorylated. Basically a phosphate group has to be attached, otherwise the glucose will just leak right back out again. So there's an enzyme that phosphorylates called glucokinase, uh, which phosphorylates that uh, glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. So glucose 6-phosphate then can be made into glycogen uh, and that is via the process called glycogenesis, or it can be broken back down into glucose 6-phosphate via glycogenolysis. Then there's an enzyme that can take that phosphate group off, and then the glucose can go and uh, supply your blood sugar, your blood glucose. So that's glycolysis, uh, glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. Um, the process, again, of breaking glucose down into energy is called glycolysis and the end result is two pyruvate molecules, which then we looked at can get into the mitochondria and then via pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, they're made into acetyl-CoA and that can go into the Krebs cycle and the uh, oxidative phosphorylation cycle. Um, so that's two of the fates, either glycogen or you know used as energy. But the third fate, if the liver you know, has enough glucose for energy. It's it needs has all the energy it needs. If it's stored up as uh, stored up enough glycogen, you know, it has a full glycogen storage. Um, the next step that can happen with glucose is that it's converted into fat or cholesterol. And again, insulin is the driving enzyme behind this, and that's why high insulin states, uh, especially with high 
glucose containing diets, high carbohydrate diets, are going to basically push you into fat storage. Uh, remember, fat is uh, triglycerides, um, so that's uh, glycerol with three fatty acids. Um, the triglycerides and cholesterol are essentially synthesized in the liver from acetyl-CoA that comes from glycolysis. Uh, if acetyl-CoA is not needed for the Krebs cycle or oxidative phosphorylation, it's going to be made into triglycerides or cholesterol. That triglyceride and cholesterol will be packaged into VLDL, as we already talked about. Um, and the VLDL then converts to LDL in the bloodstream, and that is going to deliver basically cholesterol to the different tissues. So yes, we can get fat and cholesterol from eating carbohydrate. In fact, most of our cholesterol does not come from eating fats or cholesterol. It actually comes from synthesis from carbohydrate, and a lot of people that especially overconsume carbohydrates. Um, some of the triglycerides can be stored in the liver, but uh, there's only a certain amount of room. Unfortunately, the liver cells, as they become filled with triglycerides, they stop functioning quite as well. And so we start seeing some uh, liver impairment. We already went through that whole process of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, potentially leading into non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and uh, cirrhosis and liver cancer and so forth. So this is a potential cause of NAFLD. All right. Um, so that's the third fate of glucose in the liver. So either as energy, as glycogen, or as fat cholesterol. The liver can also make new glucose via gluconeogenesis. So that's the last process we need to know about. Know about. Actually, second to last, but uh, gluconeogenesis. And that's really uh, where the liver can make new glucose. This only happens in the liver. It happens a little bit in the kidneys, but mostly the liver. The liver makes new glucose from either lactate, which comes from um, the anaerobic metabolism of glucose into not pyruvate, but to, um, to lactate. Um, and um, so that's one source that can be used to make new glucose. We can take lactate and make it back into glucose. As your muscles make a lot of lactate or lactic acid, remember lactic acid really uh, is the acidic form. So when we have you know, an, an organic acid, that's usually a carboxylic acid and that's a COH with a double bonded oxygen. That's an acid form. When we have a C, double bond O, and then we take in, in the pH of the body, in body solution, that hydrogen ion actually leaves, and we actually get a, this molecule, and that is the eight. Um, so we say lactate versus lactic acid. Lactic acid has the hydrogen ion on it. Lactate doesn't have the hydrogen ion on it. Um, and this is what usually is existing in body pH. So we usually use the word lactate, not lactic acid, to describe that. But lactate builds up in the muscles, and then it actually has to be transported to the liver where it can be reconverted back into glucose. That's called the Cori cycle. Um, and uh, so that's very important for regenerating lactate. Um, it can also make a new glucose via glycerol, via triglycerides, or some amino acids, what are called glucogenic amino acids. So those are the three primary uh, substrate for gluconeogenesis. And this requires glucagon, the hormone glucagon from the pancreas. Uh, so high glucagon, low insulin, and usually high uh, epinephrine. Uh, so your catecholamines, your stress hormones, and sometimes cortisol. So basically, this is going to be in your fasting state. Um, as your blood sugar falls, you've used up all your liver glycogen, so the liver can no longer supply that through glycogen. So the liver switches into gluconeogenesis, and uh, that's going to be fueled by you know having high glucagon from the pancreas, low insulin, high epinephrine. Sometimes people feel jittery from all that epinephrine. That's what happens in hypoglycemia. But once this process kicks in, this can resupply the blood glucose again from the liver. But again, using these three uh, substrates. Okay, in starvation, so that's going to actually last you for a while with keeping your blood sugar up. But if you start going now, maybe over 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, um, what's going to happen is the liver will start to actually make ketone bodies, and that process is known as ketogenesis. And these are derived from fatty acids. So the fatty acids are broken down into acetyl-CoA. Uh, this is also stimulated by glucagon and catecholamines like epinephrine. Uh, and we form ketone bodies. Acetone, 
which basically doesn't provide fuel. It basically is what you smell on the breath. That's that sweet, fruity kind of smell. That's acetone. Uh, acetoacetate and 2-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, these are the uh, ketone bodies. These can be used by muscle cells and brain cells and cardiac muscle cells to essentially uh, make new glucose or to make acetyl-CoA and that can fuel the Krebs cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation. So that can provide an energy substrate um, when the glucose levels are very low. So that's known as ketogenesis uh, and that's the process of ketosis. Um, now you can develop a pathological situation where we actually start to get um, ketoacidosis where these ketone bodies actually are acidic and uh, so they'll start to build up blood acidity and that uh, can be a very dangerous situation that happens in type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetics can't get glucose into their cells so they go into a process of ketogenesis breaking down fats for energy and as a result it builds up too much ketone bodies in the blood and it becomes very acid and that's called diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, so this is um, the process of starvation. So know these terms. Going back up again, we have, um, uh, we have glycolysis, of course, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, um, fatty acid synthesis, which we'll talk about later, uh, gluconeogenesis, and then ketogenesis. So know the difference between all of those different terms. All right, so that's basically all the fates. We focus on the liver because the liver is kind of a central uh, organ for carbohydrate metabolism. But of course, all cells can do glycolysis and they can use glucose for energy that way. Muscle cells can also store up glycogen. So like liver cells, they can store up glycogen. The difference between muscle and liver glycogen is that the liver, when it breaks down glycogen via glycogenolysis, can use that glucose to maintain your blood sugar levels, your blood glucose levels, so it can get out of the liver into the bloodstream. Whereas in muscle, that glucose that comes from glycogenolysis can only be used within the muscle cell uh, for its energy. So that's a big difference between the two. So I've talked a lot about glycolysis so far, but let's actually look at what happens in glycolysis. This occurs in all cells, not just liver cells. Um, there's 10 enzymatic steps that essentially oxidize glucose into pyruvate. Uh, this process does not require oxygen. This is anaerobic. Uh, again, it occurs in the cytoplasm, not inside the mitochondria of the cells. So essentially we're converting glucose into two three carbon pyruvate molecules. Uh, the reactions create a net gain of two molecules of ATP and then uh, four atoms of uh, hydrogen atoms, which uh, have electrons, which are transferred to NAD. Um, and uh, so we have two NADs that become reduced to become NADH. So this is the overall net reaction. Glucose plus two ADP plus two uh, inorganic phosphate groups plus two oxidized NAD plus becomes two pyruvate, uh, two ATP, two NADH, two hydrogen ions, um, and then two molecules of water. That's the end result of glycolysis. So we make a little energy. We make two ATPs from glycolysis. Not as much as, remember, oxidative phosphorylation, which is you know, going up over 36, 38 ATPs. Um, again, in order to prevent the glucose from leaving cells, uh, so once the glucose gets into a cell, it needs to be phosphorylated to keep it in there. And that's going to happen via the enzymes in the liver and the pancreas called glucokinase, as I mentioned. All other cells contain hexokinase. So that's just the enzyme in cells that's going to phosphorylate glucose once it gets in there to convert it to glucose 6-phosphate. So this is the starting point of glycolysis, really, is glucose 6-phosphate. And that's shown here in this uh, diagram at the top. And so here's all the steps. You see um, here we produce two of the NADHs. Here's our ATP. And uh, notice we pr produce another ATP here, but that's really used up up here where we're converting, where we're phosphorylating glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. So the net result is two NADH, two ATPs. Um, okay, so that is uh, the overall process of glycolysis. Now, one thing you'll see is that all of these intermediates between glucose and pyruvate are phosphorylated. 
Um, and that, again, is going to prevent the molecule from leaving the cell. So think of the phosphate group as helping to keep the molecule in the cell. Um, okay, so under anaerobic conditions, let's say there's no oxygen present in the cell, like let's say a muscle cell that you've been overusing, you're, you aren't getting enough oxygen to it, you do quick bursts of, of exercise that use up all your ATP. Um, pyruvate, instead of being going into the mitochondria, to make acetyl-CoA can be converted instead to lactate. Um, so lactate, again, is the ionized form of lactic acid. And uh, there's an enzyme that converts pyruvate to lactate called lactate dehydrogenase. Uh, most of the lactate will then diffuse out of the cell that produces it, that enters the blood. Again, it's going to be transported to the liver. And the liver, if... Uh, if oxygen is present in the liver, um, can actually convert the lactic acid back into glucose. So lactate can be recycled in the liver, but not in the actual cells like muscle cells and whatnot. Okay, so those are the effects uh, under anaerobic conditions. Under aerobic conditions, we've already looked at that. The uh, pyruvate will go into mitochondria in the cell, and that's where it is converted via the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Remember, that requires B1, magnesium, lipoic acid. That's converted into acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA can go into the citric acid and the oxidative phosphorylation cycle. Um, so here, starting with glucose 6-phosphate, going into pyruvate via glycolysis. Under anaerobic conditions, uh, most cells can make lactate. And we get a little ATP from that. Again, the two molecules of ATP, but not a whole lot. Um, so it can keep things running, but it's not optimal. Re really, we need aerobic metabolism, and we produce acetyl-CoA, and that goes into the uh, mitochondria and through those cycles. Um, some microorganisms can actually make ethanol via anaerobic metabolism, but that's not the case of uh, eukaryotic uh, or uh, vertebral cells. Okay, uh, or vertebrate cells, not vertebral. Um, so, okay, so that's the difference between anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. And that's the fate of glucose via glycolysis. So understand, you don't need to memorize, just like you don't need to memorize all the steps of the Krebs cycle. Uh, you don't need to memorize all the steps of glycolysis, but just understand the general process of what's happening to essentially convert a six carbon molecule glucose, phosphorylate it via either hexokinase or glucokinase, depending on the cell, uh, to end up with two three carbon pyruvates. And then pyruvate can have several different fates depending if we have aerobic or anaerobic conditions. Here is the master map, just to tie all this together. And I'm focusing here on liver cells because again, liver is able to do all these processes. Not all cells have the enzymes to do all this. So starting with dietary carbohydrates, um, we have glucose. Again, the uh, fructose galactose will be converted to glucose. Uh, the glucose will enter the liver cells that requires, um, it, it actually in the liver does not require insulin to get into the cell, but remember many cells like muscle and adipose require insulin to activate the glucose transporters. Um, and uh, we'll look at that in the diabetes uh, section, but that was uh, with the pancreas we talked about that. Um, the fructose, uh, again, fructose and galactose are converted to glucose in liver cells. Once inside the liver, Glucokinase will phosphorylate glucose to keep it in the cell, and so we get glucose 6-phosphate. Other cells use hexokinase, but that's going to be our main metabolite, glucose 6-phosphate. Now, um, most cells, uh, when they need energy, can take glucose 6-phosphate via glycolysis and use those different steps we just talked about, those 10 enzymatic steps, to end up with pyruvate. And if we have anaerobic conditions, the pyruvate is going to convert to lactate. And the lactate will then uh, have to diffuse out of the cell and be recycled in the liver. The liver can actually take lactate back to pyruvate. And then it can actually go back up the chain to make glucose 6-phosphate. Um, so that's the process of glycolysis. Now, um, to make energy aerobically, again, pyruvate can go into the... Is, uh, uh, goes into the mitochondria, becomes acetyl-CoA, that goes in the Krebs electron transport, and then we get ATP. So that can happen in, in all cells with mitochondria. Okay, so that's the basic 
you know, energy metabolism from glucose. Now in the liver, uh, remember the glucose can also be stored up as glycogen, and that's via the process of glycogenesis, and that requires an enzyme called glycogen synthase. This is only found in liver and muscle cells. Uh, insulin is needed to also stimulate this enzyme. But basically that results in glycogen. And here's a picture of glycogen. It has a protein core, and then it has all these branches of um, sugar, uh, polysaccharide branched off from it. And uh, this really is storing uh, glucose. It could be quickly, the glucose can be liberated from it via enzymes that can cleave off the individual glucose units. Um, there is a 24-hour glycogen cycle, I mentioned with the liver, where basically from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m., we are primarily breaking down glycogen to supply blood glucose, versus from 3 p.m. to 3 a.m., we're primarily storing up glycogen in the liver. So that's a 24-hour uh, cycle. And the liver literally shrinks and expands during that 24-hour cycle because of all the glycogen being stored up and then released. Um, okay, so that's glycogenesis. Then glycogenolysis requires the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. Again, only found in liver and muscle cells. This is stimulated by glucagon and epinephrine. Um, and the liver then can, uh, in, uh, this is going to be made into glucose 6 phosphate in muscle cells. They can only use that for energy via glycolysis, but the liver can actually dephosphorylate, has an enzyme to take that phosphate group off, and that provides glucose to the blood and the brain and, and other organs. Um, so the liver can supply glucose for, you know, I said up to over five hours. There's different estimates, and it really varies on a lot of different factors. Uh, some, you know, here I'm, I'm quoting the estimate that says 10 to 18 hours. That's a little bit long, uh, but, but most people for, you know, many hours after a meal can supply blood glucose. Usually the glucose from your meal is used up within one to two hours um, directly. And so the liver is going to have to supply uh, the glucose for the time between that meal and your next meal. Um, okay, so that's uh, the glycogen process there. One final process I didn't talk about is the liver can also synthesize new glucose via the process called gluconeogenesis. This only occurs in the liver, a little bit in the kidneys, but we'll just focus on the liver. This is a pretty energy intensive process, but from glycerol, from your triglycerides, some amino acids and lactate, um, the uh, liver can actually make new glucose and that can then go out if necessary to feed the body. So that is the process of gluconeogenesis and this is stimulated by the catecholamines and uh, again glucagon uh, and that's going to increase your blood sugar. Okay, so that is uh, the summary of the carbohydrate metabolism. Let's look next at lipids. Um, about 40% of calories from the standard American diet, so-called SAD diet, are derived from fats. Um, about 30 to 50% of ingested carbohydrates are actually converted to triglycerides and are stored. So again, we make a lot of our body fat actually not from dietary fat, but from liver synthesis via carbohydrates. Um, all cells except neurons can use fatty acids from triglycerides instead of glucose as an energy source. Um, so your brain needs glucose, or it can use ketone bodies, but it really prefers glucose. Uh, but other cells can actually break down fatty acids into acetyl-CoA and use that for energy. Remember again, a fat means glycerol, uh, sugar, with three fatty acids attached via ester bonds. Um, and so these are the individual fatty acids. They can be mono or polyunsaturated, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so I won't go review all that, but that's, that's the, when we say fat, that's usually what we mean is a triglyceride. Uh, most of the fat in the body is stored in our fat cells called adipocytes. Um, and together all these adipocytes, adipocytes form adipose tissue. And that's going to uh, underline your skin and your subcutaneous tissue as well as surrounding organs. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, you can build that up inside the liver and that can become fatty liver and so forth. But a lot of tissues, especially the brain, actually needs a lot of fat, especially cholesterol, um, for proper structure and function. The adipocytes can actually synthesize like the liver. They can synthesize and store triglycerides uh, during periods of food uptake. Uh, and then during fasting, the fatty acids and glycerol are released into the blood for uptake and used by other cells for energy.
uh, that are needed for ATP production. Um, fat really is a great store of energy. In fact, we think up to 80% of your energy reserves are stored in the body as fat. Um, under resting conditions, about 50% of the energy used by muscles, liver, kidneys is derived from the catabolism of fatty acids, not glucose. So glucose provides pretty much the other 50%, amino acids a little bit of that as well. But about half of your energy at rest is uh, from the uh, combustion of fats. And the main way we convert fatty acids into energy is via something called beta oxidation. This occurs inside the mitochondria of all cells. So any cell that has mitochondria can do beta oxidation. So this is another mitochondrial process. In addition to the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation we talked about, there are enzymes also in the matrix that can do beta oxidation. So what's the big picture? Well, basically fatty acids um, can be taken from the cytoplasm inside of cells and they can be transferred to the uh, matrix, the inner matrix of the mitochondria. And uh, they actually are transferred via a molecule called carnitine. So fatty acids can't directly get into mitochondria. They have to be transferred via carnitine. And there's something called the carnitine shuttle, which brings the fatty acid into the mitochondrial matrix. And uh, then uh, the uh, fatty acid inside the matrix encounters enzymes which can actually start to break it down and what happens is we essentially get two units uh, two carbon units being released from that fatty acid at a time forming acetyl-CoA so in this case with this fatty acid we see eight acetyl-CoA molecules being formed most fatty acids in the body have even numbers of carbon atoms so when they're broken down we're going to get even numbers of you know certain number of acetyl-CoA molecules. The acetyl-CoA then can enter the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain and make ATP. So this is how we make energy from fat. Um, most fatty acids, again, um, are even numbered. They're between 14 and 22 carbons long. Um, 16 and 18 are the most common ones. Um, the catabolism of one 18 carbon saturated fatty acid, so no double bonds, will give us 146 ATP molecules. Remember one glucose molecule under aerobic conditions will give 38 ATP molecules. So a lot more energy in uh, fatty acids than in glucose. So catabolizing one gram of fatty acids yields about two and a half times more the ATP than a gram of carbohydrate. So very energy dense foods. And that's why we talk about caloric overconsumption you know, people do focus a lot on fats because they contain a lot of this energy. But again, we have, we shouldn't think of fat as just storing energy. There's also beneficial effects with the good fats versus bad fats. And I won't go through all that discussion again. Uh, but uh, this is how we can convert fatty acids via beta oxidation inside of mitochondria into acetyl-CoA for energy. Now I mentioned that the liver can make ketone bodies um, and that happens when a lot of acetyl-CoA accumulates. That could be from carbohydrates, but usually it's from fats. So uh, when fatty acids are broken down into acetyl-CoA, they can be made into uh, uh, ketone bodies. Uh, this usually occurs in conjunction with gluconeogenesis and that's going to happen in, again, the high glucagon, low insulin states in the liver, where the liver can make new glucose from either lactate, uh, glycerol, uh, or the uh, glucogenic amino acids. So what happens here essentially is two acetyl-CoA molecules, they lose their CoA, they join together to form acetoacetate. So acetoacetate is just two acetyl-CoAs that are brought together, they lose the CoA part, and these two acetate groups become acetoacetate. Um, the beta hydroxybutyrate is reduced, as it's just a reduced form uh, from the acetoacetate, so it's converted readily into that. And then acetone um, is when acetoacetate is decarboxylated, it loses CO2 uh, via an enzyme that does that, and that forms acetone. The acetone, again, forms that fruity, volatile, uh, scent that you can uh, smell on people that are uh, undergoing a lot of ketosis. Um, the ketone bodies are produced primarily during low insulin states, which are going to be primarily during fasting. So when you fast, your insulin levels drop, uh, or if you do a very carbohydrate restrictive diet. So if you 
do a very high fat protein diet, low carbs, you're gonna go into ketone formation. Also occurs during starvation, prolonged exercise. Again, it can happen during alcoholism. In alcoholism, uh, the, uh, all of the alcohol is converted into acetyl-CoA, um, but you also get a lot of NADH, reduced NAD, and that inhibits the citric acid cycle. So essentially the acetyl-CoA can't be burned for energy, it's gonna be shunted actually into ketone body formation. So you see that sometimes in alcoholism and then untreated diabetes mellitus, again, that can lead to a very dangerous form of ketone formation called ketoacidosis. And uh, that uh, can uh, create all sorts of issues that we'll look at in diabetes. Um, basically, this is an energy, these ketone bodies are energy substrates. They're gonna be transported from the liver where they're synthesized to the different tissues. And uh, in those tissues, they're converted back to acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria, and uh, they can then be used to make ATP via the, the Krebs and the oxidative phosphorylation cycle. In the brain, they can be used to make long-chain fatty acids, um, which are actually important for not just energy storage, but also for brain function. So a lot of good effects of ketone bodies, and we have some interesting uh, research on ketogenic diets, diets that are you know, low in carbs, high in the fats and proteins. Uh, for, for example, pediatric epilepsy, uh, we're finding that uh, all those ketone bodies as well as the long chain fatty acids that can be made from them are very stabilizing to neurons and they can prevent seizure activity. Um, so the process of making ketone bodies is known as ketosis. That is uh, a normal process um, and in healthy, individuals, there's a constant production of ketone bodies, about one milligram per deciliter in the blood. So that's a normal process. And that occurs when the rate of production exceeds the utilization of ketone bodies. Um, and uh, so that uh, can be, so that's going to be equal to ketonemia, which is the uh, production of the ketones versus ketonuria, which is the excretion of the ketones of bodies in the urine. So it's going to be the sum of those two. So ketonuria is the presence of ketone bodies in the urine. Um, the smell of the acetone breath is common during ketosis, and uh, this is not pathological. It can be induced by nutrition, again, low-carb diets, exercise, all the things that I talked about before. And when it becomes pathological, we can get what's called ketoacidosis, and that usually occurs in type 1 diabetes. Um, and this is one of the potentially fatal outcomes of untreated type 1 diabetes, we get very low insulin, very high glucagon, and the liver tissues begin to burn fatty acids essentially, producing tons of ketone bodies. The uh, increased ketone bodies then will drop the blood pH, and that results in acidosis. Um, and usually we see here uh, ketones in much higher concentrations, so up to 15 to 25 millimoles uh, whereas in just normal ketosis, they're 0.5 to 5 millimoles, so much higher blood levels. Um, the high glucose uh, in type 1 diabetes, as well as the ketones, will spill into the urine, and that's going to pull out water. That's called osmotic diuresis, and that can cause severe dehydration. Um, this is usually fatal if not treated. So this is different than just ketosis, which is healthy physiologic. Um, this is diabetic ketoacidosis. The treatment is with insulin and usually IV fluids uh, with potassium. Um, okay, so that is uh, a little bit on ketone body formation. This is usually resulting from the catabolism of fatty acids. So beta oxidation and then potential ketosis are the results of fatty acid catabolism. Uh, but liver in adipose and also the breast, the mammary glands during lactation, interestingly, can also make fat. So we've already talked about in the case of the liver, I've kind of mentioned it as an aside in fat, but both liver and fat cells have the enzymes to take acetyl-CoA and combine it with uh, energy, essentially, and uh, basically make new fatty acids. So it's sort of the opposite of beta oxidation. Um, the enzymes to do this are found not in the mitochondria, but in the cytosol of liver cells, hepatocytes, and in adipose tissue. And uh, most of the acetyl-CoA in this case is actually from excess glucose. Um, so this is when we 
overconsume glucose. We don't need any more for energy or for glycogen storage. All the rest is essentially shunted into making fatty acids and or cholesterol. Uh, insulin is the main hormone that drives it. So think of insulin as, again, as your storage hormone uh, causing you to store up fats in this case. Basically, two acetyl-CoA molecules are added together. That's going to yield a four-carbon chain, and the process is repeated. And that's why fatty acids have even numbers, because plants and whatnot that also make fatty acids have the same enzymes, and they are making even numbers uh, of uh, carbon chains. Um, so fatty acids can then, once they're manufactured, they can be attached to glycerol, forming triglycerides. And so we saw that in the liver where we can form the triglycerides um, and that's, uh, they're attached actually to phosphorylated glycerol. Uh, it occurs within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of liver cells. Unfortunately, they can accumulate there as well and that causes steatosis. That's the accumulation of fat triglycerides within the liver cells. Uh, and that can lead to NAFOLD as we've talked about. Um, now, uh, the fatty acids can also be used to make phospholipids. So that's going to be important to you know, provide the phospholipids around the body. Uh, the bile is actually very rich in phospholipids. Um, and then uh, other lipids are needed for the cell membranes and metabolism. And there's a lot of different lipid metabolites that are important, sphingiocides and whatnot for the cell membrane. I won't get into that. But another aspect is that the excess acetyl-CoA in the liver can be synthesized into cholesterol. Uh, this doesn't occur in adipose, this only happens in the liver, uh, and this requires a special enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. Now, this is the enzyme that's targeted actually by drugs that are called statin drugs. So you've heard of those for cholesterol lowering, they block the enzyme, so it prevents the liver from making cholesterol. Most of the cholesterol in your blood is not from your diet. It's actually from the liver having synthesized it, often from the acetyl-CoA from carbohydrate breakdown. So if you block this enzyme, you lower cholesterol, and they do lower cholesterol. The, the problem with that is we know that cholesterol has a lot of beneficial roles, and we'll get into that discussion about the harms versus benefits of cholesterol lowering. But cholesterol is needed to uh, stabilize cell membranes. It's needed as a precursor for all of your steroid hormones. Very important for brain and brain function. And uh, so we can see problems at different levels with the statin drugs. And we'll look at some of the adverse effects profiles because of that. Uh, but this is the rate limiting enzyme there. Interestingly, plants, many plants have the same enzyme. And this is the enzyme they use. They take acetyl-CoA and they make... Uh, the whole class of compounds known as terpenes out of it. And there's different types of terpenes, but monoterpenes are uh, primarily volatile oils. So they make the scents of the plants, but plants can also build up larger molecules that look like cholesterol, and these are plant steroids. And a lot of our adaptogenic herbs and whatnot contain those kinds of molecules. Um, but interestingly, we can think of a person that's overproducing cholesterol is similar to a plant that is producing volatile oil. So they're sort of overflowering in a way. So making lots of cholesterol is like overflowering in the plant or making too many volatile oils. Um, okay, so that's cholesterol synthesis. Once triglycerides and cholesterol are made in the liver, again, they have to be transported into the blood. So either they're stored locally and there's only a certain amount the liver cells can hold. So the rest of it is gonna be packaged into a uh, lipoprotein called uh, VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. Remember a lipoprotein is a monolipid layer. So it's, it's a, a phospholipid monolayer. So it has a, a hydrophilic phosphate head and a lipophilic tail of a fatty acid. And then your triglyceride and cholesterol gets packaged in the middle. And then there's a big protein that's in the wall here and there's different lipoproteins with different protein, so I won't go into that. That's what's shown in this picture uh, to the right here. So a nascent VLDL has B100, C2, and E. These are the different proteins that are in the wall. And uh, basically, as the VLDL goes around the body, it's going to dump triglyceride into different tissues. Uh, these uh, little proteins, like the B100, will actually dock onto receptor sites located on the inner lining of capillaries, and then the triglyceride will be removed from the VLDL 
and over time the VLDL becomes very rich in cholesterol and that becomes LDL and that's what we call the so-called bad cholesterol. By now it only has B100 as its main uh, protein in the uh, membrane and the uh, LDL essentially dumps cholesterol into tissues and this again has a beneficial role for many tissues. They need cholesterol but if you have an atherosclerotic plaque or something like that, it will also dump cholesterol there and that can form atheromas and predispose you to coronary artery disease and so forth. So that's the, uh, why we call this the so-called bad cholesterol because it delivers cholesterol. Um, there is another type of cholesterol um, lipoprotein called HDL, high density lipoprotein, which is made in the liver. It circulates around and it grabs cholesterol from the tissues and carries it back to the liver for disposal. And the way the liver disposes of cholesterol is to actually put it into the bile. Bile secreted and then it gets, hopefully it goes through your intestine. If you have a low fiber diet, unfortunately, most of it gets reabsorbed, which is why adding fiber to the diet can actually lower your cholesterol by pulling more bile out and more cholesterol with it. Um, so that is the uh, transport of the fats to the liver. So that's the, uh, the lipogenesis. So the liver and adipose cells can make triglycerides, the liver alone can make new cholesterol, starting from acetyl-CoA. And here I've just summarized all this into one diagram. So uh, the liver, uh, starting with fatty acids here and looking at an example of palmitate, which is a 16 carbon fatty acid, um, the, and just looking at the liver specifically, the liver can synthesize fatty acids from acetyl-CoA Again, adipose can do that too. That's called lipogenesis. And then the, uh, the fatty acids can be attached to glycerol to form triglycerides. Um, and those, some of them are stored in the liver. And so if you look, for example, at normal liver tissue, these are the hepatocytes here. Here's fatty liver. You see a lot of fat accumulation in the cells. But then many of those triglycerides are packaged as VLDL, and that goes out and distributes the triglycerides uh, throughout the body. And remember, VLDL also contains cholesterol, and as VLDL delivers triglycerides to tissues, it becomes denser and smaller, and that's going to become LDL, which is very cholesterol-rich, the so-called bad cholesterol, because it is delivering cholesterol to tissues, some of them which we don't want to have cholesterol, like an atheroma in the blood vessel walls. Um, now, most tissues can take triglycerides and can break them down, basically, you know, this is what happens in digestion under the action of lipases, can uh, uh, convert them into individual fatty acids. So these fatty acids are broken off from the glycerol, and so we can get fatty acids again. And then most tissues, uh, any tissue that has mitochondria, can take the fatty acids through beta oxidation and um, can break them down into acetyl-CoA. And uh, this can then go into the mitochondria, and that forms the ATP. And that's stimulated by glucagon and epinephrine. And requires, remember, the carnitine is a nutrient for the carnitine shuttle. There's a lot of interest in using carnitine for weight loss and things like that, because theoretically, carnitine would help you burn fat by, getting, by allowing the fatty acids to be transported to the mitochondria. Uh, and there's been some studies showing that's actually true, although the weight loss is pretty mild. And that's because, again, there are a lot of other issues going on. We essentially, for this process to work, we need glucagon. If you continue, if you take carnitine as a supplement, but continue to have high insulin from eating a lot of carbohydrates, that's pretty much going to nullify it because insulin stimulates lipogenesis. It tells your liver and adipose to make more fatty acids. Uh, from acetyl-CoA. And this, again, requires energy in the form of ATP. Uh, notice in this case, I didn't mention this before, we use not NAD, but NADP. Uh, that's a special form of NAD. And that's where we see NADP showing up is in lipogenesis. That's going to transport electrons to this process to give it energy, basically. Um, beta oxidation results in acetyl-CoA. And again, that can be used for energy. It can be also in the liver, made into ketone bodies, as we talked about, um, or it can be made to synthesize cholesterol. And uh, the cholesterol then is carried out via the VLDL and becomes the LDL and delivers cholesterol to the tissues. It's brought back to the liver via HDL, high density lipoprotein. Um, the ketone bodies, again, we can have ketosis, which is a normal physiologic process. 
um, or ketoacidosis where we get blood acidity from too many ketone bodies and that happens most typically in type 1 diabetes causing diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, so that is a summary of um, lipid metabolism. I focus on the liver cell again, but again, many of these processes like beta oxidation and so forth are happening in all cells. Finally, we come to protein and amino acid metabolism. Um, so the end products, remember, of protein digestion are amino acids. They enter the portal system, they go into the liver, and then they're taken up by liver cells, and the liver cells can do several things with them. Um, basically, the liver can make human protein, all of your clotting proteins and albumin and all these other things from those amino acids. Um, so it uses essentially the liver together with other cells. So we have constantly in the blood uh, a pool of amino acids that all cells can take from. And um, this, the cells then can use those amino acids for their protein synthesis, for all their structural proteins, enzymes, and so forth. And this requires uh, dehydration synthesis. These are endergonic reactions that require energy, and uh, they can build from smaller amino acids large proteins. Um, but proteins, amino acids can also be catabolized. So once we're done, we have enough amino acid, um, we can break down the amino acids, and that's called amino acid catabolism. Um, this can also happen if there's insufficient carbohydrates or fat. We can make energy from amino acids. Um, so let's talk about amino acid catabolism here. We've already sort of talked about protein synthesis when we looked at the, uh, in the first term, uh, when we looked at proteins in general. Um, amino acids, remember, contain uh, an amino group. So if we look at the classic structure of an amino acid, just to review, we have a central or alpha carbon with a, um, an amino group, NH2. Uh, we have a carboxylic acid on one end, OH, and then we have hydrogen, and then one of 20 are side chains. So that's your 20 amino acids. So this is called the amino side. Um, so the uh, amino groups contain nitrogen, and they're gonna have to be removed when we wanna break this molecule down for energy. So that's the first thing that has to happen, is removal of the amino group. Um, and there's two different ways in which amino groups can be removed from amino acids. Uh, one is via a process called transamination, and this requires uh, enzymes called transaminases. And they're gonna transfer the amino group from an amino acid to what is called a keto acid. Um, so going from amino to, to keto. So in this case, we have, um, you know, if you look at the picture over here, there's glutamic acid, which is a uh, amino acid, has the, um, here is the alpha carbon, here is the carboxylic acid, here's the amino group, here's hydrogen, here's the side chain uh, on glutamic acid. Well, the amino group can be transferred actually to pyruvic acid. So pyruvic acid in this case acts as the keto acid. And so the amino group comes off, pyruvic acid is gonna become alanine. <clears throat> That's another amino acid. And then the glutamic acid, what we call the carbon skeleton, which remaining behind, becomes alpha ketoglutaric acid. So this is the remnant. Notice there's no amino group on there. So now that molecule can be used further for energy metabolism. Um, the enzymes that transfer the amino group from the amino acid to the keto acid are known as amino transferases. And there's two of them. One is called alanine amino transferase and the other is called aspartate amino transferase. And we abbreviate them ALT and AST. These are common in most cells. Uh, but the AST, uh, I'm sorry, ALT, shouldn't be AST, ALT is most specific to the liver. And um, if we, we actually use these, there's, there's actually in the blood a constant level of these enzymes because all cells are leaking them out at a certain rate. And, um, but interestingly, because there's a lot of them in the liver, when the liver cells become damaged, uh, they're going to leak out those enzymes, if I already, I've already talked about in the liver section, and uh, they're going to elevate. And this is what we, when people say liver enzymes, this is what they're actually referring to, is the ALT and AST. Again, most cells have them, but uh, the ALT is a little bit more specific for the liver. And uh, when we see them both elevate, usually much higher than their normal reference range, we usually assume there's some degree of liver injury that we need to look into.
Um, so that's the transaminases. So that's one way we can remove an amino group from the amino acid to attach it to a keto acid. So we haven't really gotten rid of the amino group, it's just been shuttled to a different molecule. The second way is known as oxidative deamination and urea formation. In oxidative deamination, um, the amino group is removed, the NH2 group is removed, and it becomes ammonia, which is NH3. Now I'll talk about what happens to ammonia here in just a minute, but what happens to the remaining molecule, like in this case we have glutamate, it's got the amino group on it, um, it basically becomes alpha ketoglutarate, which notice where that amino group is, we just have oxygen now, becomes oxidized, and this molecule is now alpha ketoglutarate. So the glut glutamate became alpha ketoglutarate, but it no longer contains an amino group. And notice the amino group now is here in solution as what's called the ammonium ion. Now there's a problem because ammonium ion is extremely toxic and especially to the brain. Um, so the next step that has to happen here is we have to gotta take that ammonium ion and convert it to a less toxic form. And that happens in the liver, uh, a little bit in the kidneys, but mostly the liver uh, into what is called urea. And then the urea can be excreted by the kidneys uh, into the urine. So that is um, the oxidative deamination in urea formation. Um, the uh, process of urea formation actually involves the mitochondria. So I won't go through all the steps there, but basically the um, uh, you know, we can take the, um, the ammonium group, we can combine it with carbon dioxide down here. This happens inside mitochondria. We form a compound which then combines with ornithine, becomes citrulline, then that becomes aspartate, and so forth. And the end result is this molecule, urea, which is basically two amino groups, NH2, uh, with a carbon in the middle, and then it has a double bond to oxygen, a ketone group. So this molecule is water soluble, it's non-toxic, and it can be then eliminated by the kidney. So this is how we get rid of the ammonia groups is to form urea. So urea in the blood uh, is a marker of protein turnover, protein catabolism. Um, we use it actually if the kidney is failing, the urea levels will start to rise because the urea has to be constantly eliminated by the kidneys at a specific rate. So in renal failure, there's different degrees of it, there's actually five stages of renal failure, you'll start to see the uh, amount of urea in the blood rise, and that's called the blood urea nitrogen, BUN. So BUN is actually a measure of renal function. We also look at a, another, I'll just say as an aside, we look at the clearance of creatinine. Creatinine is a muscle protein which is um, secreted into the blood at a constant rate, and the kidneys have to clear it at a constant rate. When the kidneys start to fail, creatinine levels start to rise. So we see in renal failure, increases of BUN and creatinine. But the, B, the, the uh, urea uh, is coming originally from deamination, uh, oxidative deamination from that amino acid. And then in the mitochondria, as well as the cytoplasm, it's converted into urea in liver cells. Okay, so that is the um, process of oxidative deamination and urea formation. That together with the transamination are the two ways that we can start to catabolize amino acids. The keto acids that result, so the non-aminated forms, can then be used, they can go into, be broken down into acetyl-CoA, they can go into the Krebs cycle and so forth and be used for energy. So this is the first step that has to happen for amino acid catabolism. Finally, we have to talk about amino acid and protein synthesis. So uh, we looked in the last slide at how we can break down amino acids, and then we have to either transaminate or um, you know, make urea, uh, do the oxidative deamination and urea formation to get rid of the ammonia group to, to get the carbon skeleton. But the uh, cells in the body, specifically in the liver, can also do the opposite. They can take a keto acid, like pyruvate or alpha ketoglutaric acid, like we saw on the last slide, and they can uh, transaminate those molecules to form an amino acid, specifically glutamate and alanine, and then through further uh, manipulations, they can go into making other amino acids. Um, only 11, so remember we have 20 protein-forming amino acids that we need in the body. 
Uh, only 11 of them can actually be formed via this route. Uh, nine of the amino acids that we need for protein synthesis actually have to come from the diet. Uh, so think of them like vitamins in a way. Uh, we can't make them. Uh, these are essential amino acids. So essential amino acids are the nine of the 20 amino acids that we can't actually get from, uh, we can't make in the body. And that would be isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, tyrosine, and valine. So these have to come in from meats and meat proteins. But again, plants will make many of these proteins as well. The challenge with plants is to make sure you're getting the right mix of plants. So doing you know, beans and rice is a good combination that gives a more of a full complement of, of amino acids. So those are the nine essential amino acids. Um, again, the process of synthesizing amino acids occurs primarily in the liver, because uh, this is really the site, primarily site of the nitrogen uh, metabolism. Okay, so that is the amino acid synthesis, and then the liver is also the primary site of protein synthesis. So many of the proteins we need for coagulation proteins, transport proteins, like I mentioned, albumin, and so forth, are all made in the liver. Now, other proteins like collagen are made in fibroblasts. So these are the cells in your connective tissue, but they're going to take amino acids out of the blood uh, that were uh, came in from the diet or were produced in the liver, uh, and they're going to use those to make collagen. Okay, so that is amino acid synthesis and protein synthesis, and that wraps it up for the metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better idea how all your different cells utilize these primary foodstuffs.